in progress. Okay. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath. As we look to open God's word, shall we seek his guidance to understand that which we are about to read? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunities that you present before us. We thank you, Father, also for the fires of affliction, those that are showing us items of our characters that need to be removed. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity we have to open your word, that we may open your word, consider and study your word, so that we may draw closer to you. I thank you, Father, for those that are joining in on this study, and for those that will view this study later on the video. Guide us now. May your angels attend us so that we may clearly understand that the examples that you presented and preserved in your word, so that we may come to an understanding of what you are trying to tell us for this time of earth's history. Help us now, direct us in all things. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, where we are at right now, we are about to begin Judges 21, but I have Judges 20 up on the screen in front of you. Now, part of the reason in Judges 20, verse 1, it states, Then all the children of Israel went out, and the congregation was gathered together as one man, from Dan even to Beersheba, with the land of Gilead, unto the Lord in Mitzvah. We know that Mitzvah is the watchtower. What's being referenced here on the land of Gilead? So the land of Gilead is sort of the northern section that's um, of sort of the north, northeast section of northern Israel. Okay. So it doesn't include uh, the area of Ephraim and Samaria. Okay. And the chief of the people, even of all the tribes of Israel, presented themselves in assembly of the people of God, 400,000 footmen that drew the sword. Now the children of Benjamin heard that the children of Israel were gone up to Mitzvah, then said the children of Israel, tell us, how was this wickedness? Now, we went through this this last week because there's quite a bit that we unpacked here. Yet, when I take a look here, we have the situation that as the translator see this can you can you see judges 21 now on the screen yeah the people bewail the desolation of benjamin and seek to repair it by the destruction of jabeth gilead they provide wives for 400 of those who had taken shelter in the rock the elders consult how to find wives for the remainder consistently with the oath that had been taken and advised the Benjamites to carry off by surprise the virgins that danced at Shiloh. <clears throat> now, 400,000 men of all of the tribes of Israel came 
against 26,700 of the tribe of Benjamin. We tied the 26,700 mm-hmm. as a symbol to the 1335. Yep, that's right. Now, as it is saying here, in the first verse of Judges 20, verse 1, now the men of Israel had sworn in Mitzvah, saying, there shall not any of us give his daughters unto Benjamin to wife. Yet we did not read this specifically in Judges 20. Okay. How is that? How is that tied to the 1335 again? Um, thir- uh, 1335 divided by 267 is five. So five times 267 is 1335. So it's a symbol of the five, well, the five wise, the five foolish, which is tied to the end of the 1335, the two divisions of the two groups. I see. Okay. Okay. So it's it's a bit bit uh, involved, but. But if you if you also take the twenty six thousand seven hundred and divide it by two, you come oh, up. Oh yes, yes, that as well. Yeah, you're going to come okay. up with yeah that because okay. obviously five and two that's ten. So <laughs> right. But but the the idea of the five to me is gives that symbol because we know that in Millerite history, in the parable of the ten virgins. Uh, that it was first applied to the division of the two classes under the one group accepting the midnight cry, the other group rejecting it, right? So so that's the wise and foolish virgins of the parable of the ten virgins, which is marked by April 19th, um, beginning at sunset on April 18th in 1844. So that's the end of the 1335. So that's why I like that mathematical calculation better. <laughs> I, I'm not disagreeing. I, the point that I'm trying to make is that both mm-hmm. give us the same answer. Yeah. So does that answer your, your question, brother? Yes, it does. Okay. So the men of Israel swore at Mitzpah, saying, There shall not any of us give his daughter unto Benjamin to wife. And the people came to the house of God. <clears throat> now, in this, when I see the house of God, I would, I would refer back to the Hebrew expression Bethel. Mm-hmm. So, and the people came to the house of God and abode there until even before God and lifted up their voices and wept sore. Now, when I'm looking at this, the verses that, that come back on this part would take us back to Judges 18 and then into 1 Samuel. Judges 18, verse 29 And they called the name of the city Dan, after the name of Dan, their father, and who was born unto Israel, howbeit the name of the the city was Laish at the first. So they're giving names of cities here. Uh And then 1 Samuel 3.20, and all Israel from Dan, even unto Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. So, in these situations, the people are coming together. The people are addressing what they're seeing. They're now recognizing the fact 26, seven, of, of two, 26,700 men of the tribe of Benjamin, there are only 600 now that are left. Mm-hmm. that's almost wiping out the entire tribe. 
Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and Benjamin never really completely recovers from that. Right. But it's, it, it's also interesting to me because as we're looking at this, we now have from this six, from these 600 men, we have the progenitors of Saul, the first king, mm-hmm. and Saul, who became Paul. Yeah. Genesis 21, verse 3, and said, O Lord God of Israel, why is this come to pass in Israel that there should be today one tribe lacking in Israel? Hmm. And it came to pass on the morrow that the people rose early and built there an altar and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the people are the offerings. Is it saying that they are turning to the Levites? Doesn't say. Right. Now, If we were to look at Judges 10, verse 17. Okay. And then 11, 11. Well, 10, 17 says, The children of Ammon were gathered together and encamped in Gilead, and the children of Israel assembled themselves together and encamped in Mizpah. And 11, what? 11? 11, the Dublin. Yeah. Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead. The people made him head and captain over them. And Jephthah uttered all his words before the Lord in Mitzpah. We're being shown that there is something important about this with the watchtower. Mm -hmm. We're also having to address this situation where the people are now upset with what has occurred. Now, if we review what had occurred, we come back to this in Judges 20. If we're looking at Judges 20, verse 31, excuse me, we'll go back to 2030. Okay. And the children of Israel went up against the children of Benjamin on the third day and put themselves in array against Gibeah, as at other times. And the children of Benjamin went out against the people and were drawn away from the city, and they began to smite the people and kill as at other times in the highways of which one goeth up to the house of God, or to Bethel, and the other to Gibeah in the field, about 30 men of Israel. And the children of Benjamin said, they are smitten down before us as at the first. In other words, we, have, we are winning just like we did before. Mm-hmm. But the children of Israel said, let us flee and draw them from the city under the highways. And the men of Israel rose up out of their place and put themselves in array at Baal Tamar. And the liars in wait of Israel came forth out of their places, even out of the meadows of Gibeah. So all of this is occurring because the those that lay in wait were behind the major cities of the Benjamites, but they were also in the meadows of the Gibeathites, the ones that had been given the promise 
from their falsehood of saying that we are from a fall country, the one that had been given the covenant. And there came against Gibeah 10,000 chosen men out of Israel, and the battle was sore, but they knew not that evil was near them. And the Lord smote Benjamin before Israel, and the children of Israel destroyed the Benjamites that day, 20 and 5,000 and an hundred men, all these that drew the sword. Leaving the 600. Leaving the 600. So jumping or returning to, to um, Judges 20, verse 36. So the children of Benjamin saw that they were smitten for the men of Israel gave place to the Benjamites because they trusted unto the liars in wait, which they had set before Gibeah. And the liars in wait haste, hasted and rushed upon Gibeah and the liars in wait drew themselves along and smote all the city with the edge of the sword. Or as the alternate reading would say, and the liars in wait hastened and rushed upon Gibeah and the liars in wait made a long sound with the trumpets and smote all the city with the edge of the sword. Now Joshua 6, 5 has something further for us. What does that say? So Joshua, you're saying? Joshua 6, verse 5. Yeah. Um, and it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up, every man, straight uh -huh. before him. Now, we are comparing this with the destruction of Jericho. But this same approach with the Benjamites was used against AI, was it not? Yeah. So we are accepting in this from what Brother Stephen has presented, that this occurrence with AI took place in 1493. Mm -hmm. From the evidence that we examined this last week, we know that this occurrence with the Benjamites likely did not occur more than 40 years after the destruction of AI. We know that it occurred after the death of Joshua. Yeah. It is not <clears throat> out of the realm of possibility that this occurred roughly 10 years after the death of Joshua. It's possible. That it's possibility. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to drive at is that this, the destruction of AI should have still remained in the collective memory of those that were alive at this time. Yeah. And, and just to, to review for anybody watching this is that we, we've, we clearly show that those last chapters in the book of, of Judges are actually referring to the history prior to the time of the Judges, sort of. It's, it's the time before any Judges arise. And I'm not sure why it's put at the end of the book of Judges, but it's the period of time after Joshua dies that there is no, uh, that every man just does what's right in his own eyes, that there's no, what's, what's the words that it uses? It repeats. What's the phrase that it repeats again in that those chapters? Uh, there's, there's no king in Israel. There's no king in the yeah. 
that there is yeah. no king in Israel, that every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Right. And so that's that period before the judges, technically. But they put it at the end of the book of Judges. And I don't think we determined why that is. No, why we didn't. Let's did we? See. Yeah, we did. We, we were working. Okay. It sums it up, doesn't it? Okay. As we went as we went through this before, yeah, we came to the point where we examined the fact that Phinehas was the one that was standing before the ark, the grandson of Aaron. Right. So, so we we established the timing of it, but the question is, why do they put it at the end of the book of Judges, not near the beginning? Well. That was the question I'm saying that we never answered. They have it in Judges 17, 6, too. So that was kind of like the middle of Judges. Okay. Well, that's where it starts. It starts Judges 17. That's where we're going to go to this period before all the other stuff in the book of Judges happened. So it's going to all of a sudden introduce this story of the Levite, who's really not a Levite, right? Right. But it's going to put this at the end of the book of Judges rather than putting it near the beginning. So the book of Judges is mostly going to be dealing with the judges that arise. But here in this period, this is a story. It's basically five chapters that um, precedes all of the events that happen in the book of Judges. But I'm not sure why they put it at the end. That's Maybe it's not relevant why they did that. Well, <clears throat> if they place this at the beginning where it belongs, yeah, it would show that the nation of Israel was refusing to learn the lessons that Moses and Joshua <clears throat> had been raised up to teach them. Mm hmm it shows that when man is dependent upon his own wisdom, great folly begins to occur. Mm -hmm. Now, what intrigues me, and, and I, I have asked this of Stephen, but we, we don't have a way of really being able to, to set this. We know that the type of wickedness that was occurring in this city was very similar to that which was occurring in Sodom and Gomorrah. <clears throat> uh -huh. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed because of the wickedness of the city. Uh -huh. I was very sad last night when I saw a post referring to a current article in Spectrum magazine that was asking the question, was David bisexual? Seeking to make <clears throat> the homosexual lifestyle to be that that was acceptable within the church. Now, directly, we know what the, what the verses from the law of Moses would tell us. We were examining this in other, um, in other studies. Mm -hmm. What had occurred here what was being requested when this Levite of the tribe of Judah and his concubine sought to stay the night was no different than what had occurred in Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. And this is why the children of Israel came up as one 
to inquire, what is this wickedness from among you? So we are seeing that here is going to be destruction that's going to befall Gibeah. Mm -hmm. The question that I had asked Stephen is, is there a way that we could set approximately from the time of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah to the destruction of Gibeah? And as, as we got into the conversation, we can approximate it, but we cannot be definite upon it. Uh -huh. So <clears throat> there was an appointed sign between the men of Israel and the layers in wait that they should make a great flame with smoke rise up out of the city. The city was going to be destroyed with fire. Was this also not the way that Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what's being said here, what's being shown is this was not going to be accepted. This was a destruction that was going to occur because of the decisions that had occurred within this city. With this, with this story occurring at the beginning or toward the beginning of the time of the judges, it's making a statement. Now, in the time of Moses, when they came out of Egypt, that generation that first came out with Moses died in the desert. Did they not? Uh -huh. Those that came up with Joshua, would we count them now as first generation or would we count them as second generation? Well, I'd say second generation. Okay. So here with these chapters from Judges 17 to 21, we can identify this toward the beginning of the book of Judges. I would have to place the occurrence here as a symbol of the third generation. And the balance of the book of Judges as a symbol of the fourth generation. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, there's a comment in the chat. Would you um, please expand, sister, upon... The, the verse that you're referring to here and why this is related to what we're studying. Okay, I'll read it to you. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. So they were pretty blatant about it. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. So besides all the sexual sins, there was greed and callousness, idleness, and it just went on and on. Okay. <clears throat> so the interrelation with what we're talking about here, about the third generation or the fourth generation, is what? Well, it shows me that the more you turn away from God, the more your human evil traits come out and become dominant. Okay. Now, if we were to accept the Savior's words for the generation that he faced, 
of the scribes and the Pharisees, we've accepted that as being a fourth generation, right? Mm -hmm. And how, yeah. did he, how did he describe that fourth generation? Vipers. How is the tribe of Dan described? Oh, yeah, a serpent that bites the horse's heels. Wow. So the situation that we've been having here, we have addressed the fact that from chapter 17 forward we have those of dan that seek an easier area to live in they don't want to attempt to claim that which was given them by lot they want to go to take an area that is already conquered so they are seeking the ease Then they go to this man that hires the Levite of Judah, and they want him to become their priest for the entire tribe. So they're not only seeking the ease, they're seeking and turning away from God, and now they're establishing a city and naming it after Dan. So they are, in many ways, fulfilling the prophecy. They are being this viper. Yes, and you know what? Genesis 16, uh, uh, 49, 16, it talks about Dan, and then it goes on to more about Dan in verse 17. But Ezekiel 16, 40, and I see there's 49 and a 16 and a 16 and a 49, which is also really interesting. Okay. <clears throat> Are you saying that it's interesting because of its additive qualities? I don't know what you mean, Dwight. Oh, yeah, but I, I mean, there's like Genesis 49, 16 goes with uh, Ezekiel 16, 49. That's what's really interesting, too. Well, no, 16 and 49 added together gives you 65. Okay, I had. And 65, when we're dealing with 19 and 46, are the years between when Israel was taken captive by Assyria and Manasseh taken captive by Babylon. Okay, I hadn't thought about that. I just thought you meant the, the, the verses would add more. That would explain more. But okay. I see your point. Okay. So now, as we return here to Judges 21... And the children of Israel said, who is there among all the tribes of Israel that came not up with the congregation unto the Lord? For they had made a great oath concerning him that came not up to the Lord to Mitzvah, saying, he shall surely be put to death. This is not a symbol of he who is not with us is against us this is basically saying you're either coming up and you're part of this or you will die and the children of israel repented them for benjamin their brother and said there is one tribe cut off from israel this day Four hundred thousand footmen. 
Come on. Cavanell. Given death to 26,100 of the tribe of Benjamin, and there are 600 that are left. That 600 is a true remnant. At least it is true in the symbol. How shall we do for wives for them that remain? Seeing that we have sworn by the Lord that we will not give them of our daughters to wives. So, so, uh, right. So yes. what do you mean? It's a true remnant or a symbol, a, a true symbol of a remnant, because there's only a small portion of the 26,700 that came back against all the rest of Israel. Okay, because it's 146 that's left. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So, yeah, so because 600 times 46 is 27,600. Or wait, I did that backwards. So, because it's 26,700, right? 27,600. Is it 27,600 or 26,700? It's 26,700. I was doing it backwards. Okay. Right? Because there was, because they killed, yeah, so it's 44.5. So, sorry. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I was just taking that number you said. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. You're correct, 26.7. Okay. So, 146. Well, in this case, it would be 144 uh, and a half. So, it doesn't work out. It would be, if it was 27,600, it would be 146. Okay. So. Okay. So, now, they begin to ask the question. And they said... What one is there of the tribes of Israel that came not up to Mitzvah to the Lord? And behold, there came none of the camp from Jabesh Gilead to the assembly. What's important about Jabesh Gilead? What can we determine from the name of that city? Um, well, Jabesh Gilead. Um, Okay. So Jabesh, so uh, Jabesh yes. um, means dry. Okay. Um, there's a site called the Wadi Jabesh, which means a dry stream. Um, and Gilead is a rocky re region, is what it means. Okay. So we have dry and rocky. Yeah, it also can mean a heap of testimony it comes from the word Gilead, which means a heap of testimony, a memorial cairn east of the Jordan, Gilead. Okay. Now, if we compare scripture with scripture here, we would go back and we would look at 1 Samuel 11, verses 1 to 3. Yeah. So then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead, and all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve thee. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, On this condition will I make a covenant with you, that I may thrust out all of your right eyes, 
and lay it for a reproach upon all Israel. And the elders of Jabesh said unto him, Give us seven days' respite, that we may send messengers unto all the coast of Israel. And then, if there be no man to save us, we will come out with you. So, we're tying this area in the time of the judges to that same area in the time of Saul. Right. So Saul being a descendant of the 600, mm -hmm. now we have what's going to occur in Jabesh Gilead to review and then look at this again with the story of Saul. So where would Jabesh Gilead have been? Do we have any idea of where that city would have been in the Israel of the time of the judges? Well, it's on the, the east side, Jordan. Why don't I stop my share and you show us a map, please? Okay, well, um, here's one, I guess. Okay. Just going to make this bigger. Okay, so we have this of Jabesh Gilead being quite a bit north of Shiloh, quite a bit north of Gibeah, definitely north of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. In that area, what tribe would have controlled that area? Um. Yeah, who has that area? I know the half tribe of Manasseh is possible. Uh, there was, what were the other groups on the east side, Jordan? Hmm. Anybody know what tribe controlled that particular area? I'm looking right now. Um, it would be the half. Well, no, it would have been um, uh, Naphtali. Because the half tribe of Manasseh, it, it's sort of, well. I'm, I'm looking at this right now. Now, the map I could be looking at could be very wrong because you've got the Sea of Galilee at the northern end. Yeah. Naphtali would have controlled in that area of the Sea of Galilee. Yeah. So I'm thinking from what I'm seeing, and I'm, I'm having to use a second computer, so I can't pull it up quickly on this one. Yeah. That we're either talking about, we would either be talking about Gad or we'd be talking about Manasseh. Yeah, it'd be Manasseh, because Gad is going to be um, further south. That's south. Oh, wait, hang on. Yeah, you're right. So this would end up being Gad, I think. Yeah, that would end up being Gad. Okay. Yeah, I was looking at this map wrong. Because you got the half tribe of Manasseh, or you got the half tribe of Manasseh that's going to be yeah, it just doesn't have this town here. So I'm trying to figure this out. 
Yeah, so it's either Gad or the half type tribe of Manasseh, right? The Sea of Galilee, that's going to be, Naphtali is going to be north of that. You also have Issachar in there as well, because they're kind of mixed with the half tribe of Manasseh on the west side. So if it's on the east side, it has to be then um, Gad. Okay. <clears throat> I just don't see the town itself there. Okay. Okay. So as we return to Judges 21, thank you, Theodore. <clears throat> For the people were numbered, and behold, there was none of the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead that were there. And the congregation sent thither 12,000 men of the valiantest and commanded them, saying, Go and smite the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword and the women and the children. And this is the thing that ye shall do ye shall utterly destroy every male and every woman that hath lain by man. Or from the Hebrew, and this is the thing that you shall do, you shall utterly destroy every male and every woman that knoweth the lying with man. So, you are now to go in, you are to destroy every man in this city you are to destroy every woman married or unmarried that has been with a man so we have this issue they've come against gibeah because of a great sin. They are destroying the Gibeathites and they are destroying the tribe of Benjamin. Now they are repenting of what they have done. Joshua 21, verse 12. And they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead 400 young women virgins that had known no man by lying with any male. And they brought them under the camp to Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan. Why would Shiloh at that point be in the land of Canaan? What are they saying to us here? Well, uh, why they're saying it's in the land of Canaan? Yes. Well, that's that's Palestine. I'm not sure why they call it Canaan. Mean at this time, because if we compare this against Joshua 18 verse one, what do we find? The whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there, and the land was subdued before them. So they already had subdued this area. It's right. why they refer to it as in the land of Canaan. I'm not sure. So they bring these young women to the city where the ark was. Mm -hmm. And the whole congregation sent some <clears throat> to speak to the children of Benjamin that were in the rock Ramon and to call peaceably unto them. 
but the alternate readings would say, and the whole congregation sent and spake and called to the children of Benjamin that were in the rock Ramon and to proclaim peace unto them. So if they are speaking and calling, is that a doubling of what's going on? Uh, or is that a stretch? <clears throat> um, well, so let me see here. Judges 21, 13, so. Okay, so speak is the normal word to bar. Uh, kara is the word here for call out. Okay. It is to address by name. Okay. So I don't I don't know if I would call it a doubling. So it's okay. like to call on peace of real someone means to uh, basically greet them. So I don't I wouldn't see it as a doubling. They're just two different ideas. But if we're looking at the at the Hebrew word as you just pointed out, yeah. If they're calling someone by name. Yeah. They have a knowledge of who that person is. Yeah. So in this situation, you have those that know personally those men that have now taken shelter in the Rock Ramon. Yeah. And you're going to basically greet them. Right. You know, pleasant to them. Right. And so they're going to then give these, these women as wives. So as we look at this, Moses stated in Deuteronomy 20, verse 10, when thou comest nigh unto a city to fight against it, then proclaim peace unto it. I believe if we look further at that, the, the portion that Moses is referring to is that you come to fight against the city, you proclaim peace to it, if they will accept the peace, if they will accept what you are teaching, then you can accept them. But if they will not, then you are to destroy them. Hmm. And Benjamin came again at that time, and they gave them wives, which they had saved alive of the women of Jabesh Gilead. And yet, so they sufficed them not. So this, this term from the Hebrew, yet so they sufficed them not. What, what are we actually seeing in the Hebrew rather than in Elizabethan English? Uh, well, it means to come forth, to appear, or exist transitively to attain, that is find or acquire. Um, it means lots of different things that it's translated as. Um, so it just means they did not have, uh, what it says in Young's literal translation it says they have not found for all of them. Okay. So, because they have 400 young women, I guess there's 600 men. Right. <clears throat> okay. So, they have found wives for part of them, but not all. Of them. Yeah. And the people repented them for Benjamin because the Lord had made a breach in the tribes of Israel. What 
is meant here by that the Lord had made a breach in the tribes. Well, Iran put a separation there. Okay. A breaking forth or a gap, right? Hmm. So there's... It's being noted that there was a lack now. In the in within this in the tribe of Benjamin, that we now have these women that are taken, possibly of the tribe of Gad, that are now going to become the wives of the men of Benjamin. Then the elders of the congregation said. How shall we do for wives, for them that remain, seeing the women are destroyed out of Benjamin? So we're dealing with a tribe of Benjamin. 600 men are left. 400 are now to be called out, to be given wives, wives need to be found for the 200. And they said there must be an inheritance for them that be escaped of Benjamin that a tribe be not destroyed out of Israel. Uh -huh. So they are recognizing the fact that this evil, this foolishness, has resulted in the death of the men of Benjamin. That you have this very small group of men that remain. So they take the women of Jabesh Gilead, 400 of them are now to be coupled with 400 men. Uh -huh. How be it, we may not give them wives of our daughters. For the children of Israel had sworn, saying, Cursed be he that giveth a wife to Benjamin. In 21.19, then they said, Behold, there is a feast of the Lord in Shiloh yearly, in a place which is on the north side of Bethel on the east side of the highway that goeth up from Bethel to Shechem and on the south of Labona. So we're given a very decided instruction and direction. The feast is held in Shiloh. Bethel is on the north. Yeah, about 10 miles away. On the east is the highway that goeth up from Bethel to Shechem. And on the south of Libona.
So Shiloh is on, if I'm reading this correctly, Shiloh, which is on the north side of Bethel. Right? Mm -hmm. North of Bethel, about 10 miles. Okay. So Bethel is to the south of Shiloh, and Labona is to the north of Shiloh. Right? Yeah, that's what it would seem like. At least it's on the way, the highway that goeth up from Bethel to Shechem, on the south Labona. So the house of the Lord at Shiloh, being on the north of Bethel, of the house of God, we are given some figurative examples of those that could be considered the king of the north, the king of the south, but also of Islam on the east. Hmm. Yeah, so Labona is kind of um, west of Shiloh. Is it? To this map, yeah. So, so when you're going up to Shechem, there's a highway that goes from Bethel up to Shechem and basically going straight north. Shiloh goes off to the to the east of that, and uh, the highway goes right past Labona, which is east of Shiloh. Okay. Or west, pardon me, west of Shiloh. Shiloh is east of Labona. Okay. I can show you a map if you want. That'd be good. Uh, okay, so there we go. So there's Bethel, Shechem up at the top, Labona here, and Shiloh over here. Okay. 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 So the passage makes sense. It's just trying to place the cities and, and get a yeah. representation. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, the highway that goeth up from Bethel to Shechem and on the south of Labona. So the Feast of the Lord in Shiloh, yearly in a place which is on the north side of Bethel, on the east side of the highway that goeth up from Bethel to Shechem, and on the south of Labona. Yeah, it's just weird how they word that. Mm -hmm. And even the, the alternate gives us it this way. Then they said, behold, there's a feast of the Lord in Shiloh from year to year. In a place which is on the north side of Bethel toward the sun rising on the highway that goeth up from Bethel to Shechem and on the south of Lebona. Now, we know what Bethel means. Yeah. We were addressing Shechem. What's Lebona? Frankincense. Interesting. So we have the frankincense, we have the house of God, we have the ark in Shiloh. And how did we, we approach this on Shechem as a, as a meaning? Um, well, it's a ridge. It, it means literally back or shoulder. So okay. it's, uh, uh, it's like when I would uh, backpack, I used to go to a place called Jonah's Shoulder in uh, 
uh, in Jasper. And uh, basically, it's a ridge, but they call it a shoulder. So, um, Can we say that that would carry the burden? Well, yeah, because it comes from the word neck or shoulder, between the shoulders, as the place of burdens. Uh, figuratively, it means the spur of a hill. Okay. So the back or portion or ridge of a hill or mountain. Okay. So, 2120, therefore they commanded the children of Benjamin saying, go and lie in wait in the vineyards. Why is it important that they lay in wait in the vineyards? <laughs> Is it saying that you are to wait until the doctrine is established, until the doctrine comes to fruition? Yeah, it's interesting. It's a very strange story. Yes, it is. <laughs> and see and behold, if the daughters of Shiloh come out to dance in dances, then come ye out of the vineyards and catch you every man his wife of the daughters of Shiloh and go to the land of Benjamin. So here again, I will ask this. We're saying, we're seeing this. Behold, if the daughters of Shiloh, if the churches of Shiloh come out to dance in dances, if the churches come to accept the second angel's message. Because dance in dances, I believe, would be a doubling. Yeah. Uh, now, there, there are two different words, but their idea, one just, because if you look at the Hebrew numbers, they look very different. Yes. But that's just because dances is um, a noun, and they put a mem in front of it. That's the right. letter M. Um, and then the word dance just is basically the same root, but without the mem in front of it, so without the letter M. Um, so they're, they're basically the same wor word. Okay. Right. So if we look at this in the figurative, If the churches come out to dance in the dances, then come ye out of the vineyard, catch you every man his wife of the daughters of Shiloh, and go to the land of the son of my right arm. Well, yeah, that's Benjamin. Some of the right hand. Right. But who sits on the right hand of God? Well, Christ. So, in a figurative way, are we looking at this and can we apply this? That if there are those churches that come out to celebrate the message, that they should become. Wives of Christ? Yes. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? Any comments? Luke 7, uh, 32. 
or 31 and 32, and the Lord said, we're on to then shall the like of the men of this generation, and what are they like? They are like unto children sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another and saying, we've piped unto you and you have not danced, you have mourned to you and you have not wept. So if the churches are mourning and weeping and dancing and celebrating in response to, it, to our message, well, it's, just, it's just showing what kind of response we should look for, right? If they reject it, they're not going to be dancing and celebrating, but if they receive it, they will be spiritual. Okay, good points. So, Judges 21-22. And it shall be when their fathers or their brethren come unto us to complain that we will say unto them, be favorable unto them for our sakes, because we reserved not to each man his wife in war. For ye did not give unto them at this time that ye should be guilty. And the children of Benjamin did so and took them wives according to their number of them that danced from whom they caught and they went and returned unto their inheritance and repaired the cities and dwelt in them. So we have established that this city that is destroyed, Jabesh Gilead, was possibly very likely in and within the tribe of, of Gad. Shiloh, within what tribe did Shiloh reside? Or where do we find it? Well, I'm looking and I'm, I'm having to ask the question because the map that I'm looking at would almost place Shiloh within Ephraim. Yeah, that's what I'm seeing here too. So it's going to be in Ephraim. So, it adds something to the story that we saw in 1 Samuel, where Saul comes up to Jabesh Gilead to defend it against the attack. If it was not for the city of Jabesh Gilead, there is a two out of three chance that Saul would not have become the king because there might not have been a Saul. So when this attack is occurring at Jabesh Gilead in 1 Samuel, Saul is going up to potentially defend other family members of his tribe. And I could have that very wrong.
and I am willing to be corrected on this point. Mm. And the children of Benjamin did so and took them wives according to their number of them that danced, whom they caught, and they went and returned unto their inheritance and repaired the cities and dwelt in them. And the children of Israel departed thence at that time, every man to his tribe and to his family. And they went out thence, every man to his inheritance. Now, as we are looking at this, as we come to this, the final verse of chapter 21, in those days there was no king in Israel, Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. We know that this has been repeated multiple times within these particular chapters. We have an examination here of what man looks to do left to his own devices when he is not relying upon God. But we also have an examination of exactly what is going on within the fourth generation. What we are seeing that has been occurring now within the exists within this church and within this movement. The story is a hard one to, to take. The example is difficult to take because we're being forced to look at ourselves. We're being forced to look at our own characters. And we're having to question, does this represent me? We have many symbols that we have to look at. This, these chapters from 17 to 21 would be interesting, yet difficult to draw upon a line. But it may be something that we're going to have to consider. Now, the interesting thing about this section is that it's sort of appended to the book of Judges. Right. Right. And 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 it, they're going to have this, this phrase, in those days there was no king in Israel, and in those days the tri um, that every man did what was right in his own eyes, that type of idea. Um, chapter 17 isn't going to contain that phrase, but chapter 18, verse 1 does. Oh, no, wait, ja Judges, pardon me, Judges 17 does in verse six right um but it does it at the end of the story so that is you tell the story and then you make this statement you don't start the story with that statement right that's right. why Judges 21 ends with that statement um so it's kind of a strange thing to tell the story and then uh, put that at the end so judges 17 has it in verse it tells this first part of the story and then it tells another story, and then chapter 18, verse 1, is actually really going to be appending uh, the end, that second story in chapter, the chap, beginning of chapter 18. Um, and, and really, they should have not. They should have put it at the end of chapter 17. Okay. But they didn't in the, it, because they looked at it as something that starts it. And because it's then is going to say, and there in those days there was no king in Israel, Judges 18.1. And in those days the tribe of the Danites sought them an inheritance, which is actually now a completely different story. <laughs> it is well, completely different, but it's starting another story. So 18 verse 1a is ending chapter 17. And 18.1b is beginning this new account that's in chapter 18. 
Um, so it's just kind of odd. And again, chapter 19 um, puts that at the beginning, but it really should have been at the end of chapter 18. And we can see that by chapter 21, having it at the end. So anyway, that's the way I understand it. I was I, I was kind of looking at this as if this was kind of a like a brackets, a set of brackets saying this is all a story for consideration. Yeah, um, I don't know if I put it as brackets. I think they just put it at the end of the stories. That's the way that I read it there. But um, but the thing is, this is not the period of the judges per se, because they don't have the judges yet until uh, the first judge after the je death of Joshua. Uh, then in Ch Judges 2, they're going to talk about the Lord raising up judges. Right. Um, and then and then they're going to start listing who those judges are um, as you go through them, you know, Othniel and Ehud and so forth. But so this is put at the end of the period of the judges. It's put in that book, but it's not really addressing the judges at all. Exactly. And, and it's prior to the time of the judges. So so it's just kind of interesting that it's done this way. Like uh, maybe I belabor this point too much, but it's just kind of it's a very interesting section. Of the book of Judges. That I would have put at the beginning if I was writing this out. But, but God has his reasons. Hmm. So in, in this situation, I mean, I, I know that we do not have Hebrew scrolls. But would this have occurred at the end of a Hebrew scroll of this? Or would this have... Is it possible that the translate the, the those that had these books, these scrolls before, placed it toward the end because they didn't know where to put it? I don't know. Yeah, that, I have no way of knowing that. Right. We don't. None yeah. of us do. Yeah. But we know that there were no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. In other words, this time, the children of Israel had not chosen to accept the theocracy of God. Mm -hmm. That's a very telling point to me. Because if there is no king, then you're saying that God is not king. Mm -hmm. It's not just that there was not a human representation. They're, they're basically setting aside everything. Mm -hmm. It's like God was giving them opportunity. I can see that. Now, what else can we say about this portion that we've read today? I mean, we're dealing with the almost total destruction of the tribe of Benjamin. The tribe of Benjamin being the second son of Jacob and Raquel. the son of my right hand. So it, it's intriguing because all of the tribes come against one tribe.
the one tribe is almost totally wiped out after that one tribe has a couple of fairly good victories against a much larger force. Then the application is made just like the children of Israel did against Ai. And it's surprising that that example did not even occur to the men of Benjamin. That this could happen just like it did with AI. Now we have the situation that here is the remnant of Benjamin. They, the, the tribes of Israel go against Jabesh Gilead to find them wives. They wipe out the city and find 400 wives. And then they instruct the others that are hiding in the rock Ramon to come at the time of the feast at Shiloh. And we know that it was a yearly feast. Mm -hmm. So what was the yearly feast that was held at Shiloh? Well, it's hard to say what particular feast this could be. Um, but this is, uh, I mean, they have the vineyards there, but I don't know. Um, well, you, you would not hide in the vineyards if the crop had already been brought in. Right. Possibly not. Well, what cover would you have? Not much. So it maybe be before the harvest, before the grape harvest. Okay. And so when was the grape harvest to have occurred? Well, that was in the fall. So my question would be, you likely would not have had the, the grape harvest prior to the Feast of Trumpets? Or would you? I don't know. So that I don't have a question to you or an answer to that question. Okay. Um, we know <clears throat> that at the, the Feast of Tabernacles, all of the harvest was in, including the grape harvest. Yeah. We know that it would not have been in spring because that's when the grapes are just beginning to grow. Yeah, so it'd probably be in the fall. Okay. But I'm not sure exactly. I'm trying to find out when the gray part of it is. Um, okay. At the end of summer, beginning of fall. I'm just trying to see the summer harvest. See, in the fourth month, because I'm looking at the charts book here, Sacred Cycles of Seven, and it shows first grapes, fourth month. Hmm. Well, at the last house I had, I had a very untended grapevine. And when it was tended, it, it grew some of the most sweet grapes that I've ever had. They were amazing Concords. Okay, so go to Deuteronomy 16, 13 to 15. Okay. What does that say? Um, it says, 
Thou shalt observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days, after that thou hast gathered in thy corn and thy wine. Thou shalt rejoice in thy feast, thou and thy son and thy daughter, and thy manservant and maidservant, and the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow that are within thy gates. Seven days shall thou keep the feast of the Lord thy God in the place that the Lord shall, shall choose, because the Lord thy God shall bless thee in thy, all thine increase and in all the work of thine hands. Therefore thou shalt surely rejoice. So it's going to be in connection with uh, the wine or the grape harvest. So if this is if this is indeed the case, this would go along in the lines of what I was what I was trying to the point I was trying to make. Yeah. I was very used to the fact that the grapes, as they as they would mature, if they had a very hot summer, you would look to harvest your grapes toward the end of of September or October, when the weather was just beginning to turn. Mm -hmm. Now, as we are, are basically in the same regions as we would as we would have with Israel, same latitude, same long, same same latitudes, basically, right? Mm -hmm. The final feast of the year would make more sense because you would still have the foliage you would have the grape leaves so they would be able to hide among the vines we would have the yearly feast of the feast of tabernacles and there would be much rejoicing that would occur at that time because the harvest was now done. So I think it, it logically, we could place this portion where these wives are taken, occurring after the Day of Atonement, mm -hmm. And about the time of the of the Feast of Tabernacles. Yeah. <clears throat> so if they're taken after the Day of Atonement, is this after the third angel's message is fully given? Because you would have a, a harvest that would be being made ready for the sickle at that point. I mean, you're talking a very short amount of time, right? Mm -hmm. You're talking from the 10th day of the seventh month to the 15th day of the seventh month. So could we line this up in that way? Hmm. Okay, so if we take this story, mm -hmm. right, we're going to put it as uh, the message that's going to happen as the loud cry prior to the Feast of Tabernacles. Right. Um, that, definitely, that definitely would fit based upon all the symbolism that we've seen in this story. Okay. So Christ has... I mean, he he doesn't have sufficient wives. 
So we're going to the highways and the by, by, byways, so to speak. Right. Um, we're calling these people in to the wedding feast. Right. Okay. So it could be illustrating that story. I mean, we, we were just given the, the examples of the highways to Beth. Mm -hmm. Milo, Libna. Mm -hmm. So we're definitely applying the, you know, the highways and the byways. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're also applying the yearly feast or the Feast of Tabernacles. Mm -hmm. We know that there is a, a short amount of time between the, the situation, the, the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles. Mm -hmm. So, most of this application fits. Mm -hmm. It's just a very strange story. Yes, it is. Extremely strange. Yeah. Okay. You know, it seems, excuse me. Go ahead. Yeah. It seems that um, you started out talking about the first part of the story where the the people of, of Benjamin were um, needed to be separated or to be destroyed because of their choices. Mm -hmm. um, and if you think about Israel as being the church, in other words, you could say that <clears throat> there are individuals within the church which we we can't we don't see or don't understand their their lifestyle and their character but they represent those that really are there i don't know what to say not as as uh, worshipers of god but for their own benefit yeah and, and then we're going to have this um uh this basically cleansing of benjamin right right uh, going from 26,700. So there was 26,000 Benjamites that came to protect the city, 700 in the city, and, and then they end up being killed, and we end up with only 600 left. Um, and then we have this, uh, the fact that Benjamin is now basically wasted they're going to provide wives for them. They get some from Jabesh Gilead, 400 of the, these virgins, and then they get these 200 from basically, uh, you know, through an ambush, grabbing them when they're dancing in the fields. It's, it's a very strange story. But uh, we can see how it can illustrate um, the work at the end of the world. And we talked about this remnant. So... So this is, uh, I mean, this is about the work at the end of the world that God has in saving those that will be saved. Right. Yeah. But it's, it, it's giving us some, some other points to consider out of this, too. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's about 10 after 9, not that we have to rush, but I do want to, I was wondering, uh, Dwight, yes, whether sir. we wanted to have a discussion about what we had talked about uh, earlier in the week um, afterwards. So good idea. Yeah, so after we close, we could talk about that. Okay. So any other comments or questions at this moment? Any other thoughts of what we've been studying these last several weeks? None, except I'm really thankful for this. It's opening up my eyes to a lot, and I know there's a lot more to find. Okay. All right. So shall we close with prayer? Yeah. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you are providing. 
We thank you for this example for our time that we need to consider and we need to carefully consider it. The entirety of these chapters are not easy for us to take in. We need your guidance. We need your wisdom because you have placed this here for our admonition at the close of this world. Help us now, Father, guide us in all that you would have us to address. Direct us in the path that you would have us to walk so that we may learn to walk with you. May your will be done. May your guidance be clear. May we truly enter into your Sabbath rest in all in we address and in all conversations that we have today. For this, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.